Thank you all so much for joining me for our webinar on Western New York's Emerging Forest Pests and Diseases, the second webinar in Western New York PRISM's Fall Webinar Series. My name is Emily Thiel, and I am Western New York PRISM's Education and Outreach Program Manager. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Andy Lance. Andy earned his Bachelor of Science from Bethany College in West Virginia, and later his Master's of Science from the Bard Center for Environmental Policy. Following graduation, Andy taught at Lorain County Community College in Ohio and simultaneously worked as a field botanist with Cleveland Metro Parks, developing in-depth vegetative assessments of a wide variety of habitats within the Metro Park system. While working with the Cleveland Metro Parks, Andy returned to complete a PhD in biology with a focus in ecology and evolution from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. His dissertation work focused on the development of best methods for urban reforestation projects. This work has led to multiple publications in the journal Restoration Ecology, as well as publications in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. He is now the Restoration Project Manager at the Western New York Land Conservancy. So I will let Andy take the stage and tell us all about beech leaf disease. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction. So. Um, I will be the bearer of bad news today, unfortunately, and I'll be speaking to you about beech leaf disease. And what's interesting is Western New York is the invasion edge of this disease right now. So I think it's very important that we all start looking for this disease on the landscape and tying that into kind of what's becoming a national effort to understand how this disease is moving across the landscape. I'll go ahead and just briefly, briefly talk about American beech. I know this audience is quite familiar with this species. It's an incredibly important species here in, in western New York, meaning it, it has a, a relatively high frequency and density in a forest. It's very important from a wildlife perspective. Um, it's a masting species, so in forests that tend to lack a lot of oak, it can be an essential wildlife food source. And northeastern populations have been, you know, um, impacted by beech bark disease, not to be confused with beech leaf disease, for, for a long time now, almost to 100 years since it was first observed in Massachusetts in 1929. Beech bark disease actually started out up in Nova Scotia, so a maritime province of Canada, and moved in a southwestern direction toward uh, where I'm currently at, which is actually in right here in central Ohio. <laughs> I'm right on the edge of beech bark disease. We don't have much of it here. Now, the opposite pattern is happening with beech leaf disease. Beech leaf disease was first detected in Lake County, Ohio, here in White, back in 2012. The following year, it was discovered in neighboring Ashtabula County as well as Geauga County, Ohio. The year after that, we started to see it in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. This is where Cleveland is located. And then shortly thereafter, it moved into northwestern Pennsylvania. And as of 2018, this data is two years old. It was present in Chautauqua County in New York. I know it has now been documented in Erie as well as Cattaraugus County. So it is moving in a northeastern direction which is the complete opposite of beech bark disease. Now, what does beech leaf disease look like, you might ask? What should you be looking for in the field? Um, and here we're looking at a picture of a branch that has what we would consider three different leaf conditions on different twigs. So we have here an asymptomatic leaf. So what you would traditionally see on American beech, right? very healthy looking, very green in this intervenal region. Here we have what I consider to be a mid-symptom leaf, and the key characteristic that you're looking for is this dark banding pattern in the intervenal region of the leaf. Now we also have heavy symptom leaves on this tree, and these are characterized by this large percentage of necrotic tissue Essentially, the leaf at this point is completely blackened and curled in along the edges. So these are three different stages, if you would, of disease, although I'm going to show a picture in a, uh, in a moment that actually shows the disease very early on, and that's what we're seeing 
currently in Erie and Niagara counties. So this is just another quick picture of what you would be seeing in the field. These are mid to severe symptom leaves. The, this tree would probably die within a year or two of this level of infestation. However, this is what you're more likely to see here in western New York. And this is what I see a lot of nowadays. And it's this bubbling appearance in the intervenal region. Uh, we haven't yet seen the darkened bands forming on this particular leaf, but we're seeing this, uh, what we might want to think of as almost like a physical bubbling in the region where I would expect to see darkening within the next year. So if I was to, which I did, of course, uh, find the coordinates of this tree and I return to it next year, I expect to see some of that intervenal darkening increasing in frequency. But this is a very early symptom leaf that we're looking at. All right, so what can this do to a forest? So this is a picture of compliments of Cleveland Metro Parks. Cleveland Metro Parks runs a very intensive vegetation research program where they have over 400 research plots throughout the Metro Park system, and they sample those in a five-year repeating cycle. So this is a picture of a beech maple forest in 2011 when the program began, and five years later in 2016, you can see the decimation that this disease has caused on this particular stand. So when we look at data, uh, it essentially backs up the fact that as time has progressed, the incidence of this disease has progressed as well. So back in 2015, out of the 60 plots that they sampled, um, 12 of them had beech leaf disease. A whopping four seasons later, you were looking at, you know, 62% of all plots having beech leaf disease present in them. So exponential increase in the disease on the landscape. So what's causing this disease, you might ask? And this is where we're going to shift gears and talk about forest pathology for a moment, if you're all okay with that. Um, but, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is fungi. And, and fungi are, you know, certainly notorious plant pathogens, and they do cause a wide array of symptoms across, you know, virtually all plant taxa. So the work I'm, I'm showing you is work that was conducted in David Burke's lab at Holden Arboretum in Ohio. And David Burke is a molecular ecologist who has done some, some really important work in parsing out the pathogenic aspect of this disease and what could potentially be causing. So a lot of this data is compliments of David, I must say. But what we're looking at here is what's known as an MMDS plot. So a non-dimensional multi-scaling plot. And it's simply a way of visualizing ecological communities. So all you need to know is that points that are close together in space, like these two points and these two points, are not significantly different from each other as far as a community composition standpoint. If they're far apart in physical space, they are significantly different in fungal community composition. So what we see here is two patterns. Leaves, which are symbolized by the squares over here, and buds have very different fungal communities. But symptomatic and asymptomatic trees, both the leaves and the buds are virtually the same when it comes to fungal community composition. And if you wanted a p-value associated with this, it's about 0.37, so it's non-significant. What does this mean? It means that fungi are probably not the driving mechanism to this disease. So bacteria are oftentimes the next thing that people are going to look at. And as with fungi, you know, bacteria are often associated with plant disease. So we're looking at the same type of plot over here. And what we see is that within buds, there's no real difference in bacterial communities. But by the time we get to leaves, which were sampled in this case in, I believe, August or September, there is a very distinct difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic leaves. 
And this has a strongly significant trend, as we can see by the p-value. So this is suggesting that bacteria may be playing an important role, or some role at least, in this disease. Now, the bacteria um, communities were cloned and sequenced, and while several pathogenic bacteria did appear in those clonal libraries, none seemed to be dominant enough to potentially cause the severity of symptoms seen in these trees. So David and his lab, which at the time included myself, decided to look further at the leaf microbiome. So basically that includes things such as uh, microscopic worms, which we're going to talk about in a second. <laughs> um, so we did, you know, we didn't see any significant differences in fungi communities. We did see significant differences in bacteria communities. However, the big question that remained was whether bacteria were the only cause of the disease or whether they were acting kind of in concert, if you would, with another causal agent. So people started to notice using electron microscopy that there seemed to be a high abundance of nematodes within these symptomatic trees. And it turned out through various techniques, which we can talk about in a minute, primarily molecular methods, that this was a fairly newly described species of nematode and this species of nematode is native to Japan. So it's a Lytilenchus species. Um, it's like I said, as you can see here, this is fairly new. We're talking about April of this year. It was on the cover of Forest Pathology. So there's this idea that maybe nematodes are playing an important role as well. So like I said, it was molecular work that determined what the nematode actually was. And this was the first North American description of this species. And it was, the molecular work was combined with electron microscopy, as you saw with those pictures, to confirm the presence of this particular nematode species on symptomatic American beech trees. So there were definitely nematodes to be found on symptomatic trees. And when you look at some simple data such as this, right, which is simply showing the percent of samples that positively have nematodes versus the visual disease severity. As disease severity progresses, so does the percent of samples that are positive for nematodes. Now, in a microbiology lab, uh, let's not look at this. These are the primers that were used for this work, so we'll skip over that. In a microbiology lab, you want to close Koch's postulates, so that oftentimes involves inoculation studies. So what happened was essentially buds were inoculated as well as leaves, but the bud inoculation is highlighted here. And what, what took place was a wetted chem wipe um, and added nematodes, which were extracted from symptomatic tissue using basically a water process, was then inoculated into the buds. Um, the nematodes were allowed to colonize the bud via basically creating favorable conditions. It then, of course, needed to be shown that nematodes could be extracted from these buds and actually shown to be present and used to inoculate sample trees. Now, of course, the next thing of, of Koch's postulates that we need to kind of put forth is the idea that you need to see symptoms in previously asymptomatic trees. So that's what this slide is showing, is that you're seeing symptoms in a, what were previously asymptomatic trees. This is post-inoculation. To close out the postulates, the nematodes were isolated from these plants and confirmed to be present. So indeed, you could take an asymptomatic plant, you could inoculate it with a given agent, in this case, the nematode species that I previously mentioned, observe the symptoms in the previously asymptomatic plant and then isolate that causal agent once again. That's kind of what went on. So in, in summary, beech leaf disease is likely, and I mean quite likely, <laughs> to be the cover of plant pathology, I think that, that kind of says so, caused by a nematode from the Pacific Rim. The results, or what you're seeing in the field, is this intervenal darkening 
and as the disease progresses, leaf death. Some intervenal yellowing can occur late in the year, as well as that bubbling pattern, which I pointed out earlier. This usually results in a thin canopy after several years. It can eventually kill adult trees. However, one important point that I haven't made yet is that this disease tends to progress from the ground up. So it's actually the understory. It's the next generation of American beech, which seems to be most impacted by this disease. Many of the trees that are high in the canopy don't seem to display a severe of symptoms. This makes logical sense given the fact that they're exposed to greater amounts of sunlight and therefore likely are drier, and that is a harsher condition for a nematode to persist in. But that's kind of a hand-waving type of statement. <laughs> but there is a possible bacterial component as well. Currently, the disease is concentrated in the Great Lakes, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Ontario, although it has been found in, in areas as far away as Connecticut and Long Island. And there seems to be some interesting population dynamics going on, much lower levels of nematodes through the summer, but in autumn, this explosion in population. So oftentimes, one of the best times to look for this is actually in autumn. And there's a lot of work currently being undertaken looking at whether certain pesticides could be effective at not only maybe uh, you know preventing this disease, but treating it as well. And that work is currently underway. So how can you help? You can help by using something known as the Tree Health Survey. And this is all kinds of different partners working together to kind of report the incidence of this disease. It is available for both Apple and Android. The Android is out. I know on the slide it says pending, but you can get it for Android now. And it's, it's quite easy to follow. It's quite self-explanatory. And this is a great way to help these different agencies track the progression of the disease. If you're not comfortable using this app, Keep some good paper records, send them to either myself or to Constance Hosman at Cleveland Metro Parks. I'll show her information here in a moment. So please, you know, keep an eye out for this as you conduct field work. So with that, I just need to really uh, spe give some special thanks to, to Cleveland Metro Parks, in particular Connie Hosman. You can see her email down here. You can contact Connie if you have some further concerns or some particular questions you would like answered. And I also need to especially thank David Burke, um, who's the Vice President and the Science and Conservation Chair at Holden Forest in Gardens. David was an influential member of my dissertation committee, as was Connie. So uh, both of these people have been instrumental in really uh, making progress on this disease as far as determining the causal agents. Last but not least, I really want to thank you guys for listening to me today and hopefully learning something from this presentation. And I'll leave you with just a few different papers that you might want to look at if you have access to peer-reviewed literature. Um, and there is my contact information in the lower right-hand corner. You are certainly most welcome to contact me with any questions you have. Great, Andy, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to teach us about beech leaf disease and share your experiences with it. Thank you for having well, me, appreciate it. Yes, anytime. So just to start, I'd like to introduce my organization for anyone unfamiliar with Western New York PRISM, which is the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. We are one of eight PRISMs in New York State and our region covers the eight westernmost counties of New York State. And basically, our mission can be boiled down to minimizing the harm caused by invasive species. And we do this in coordination with a wide variety of partnership organizations, including but certainly not limited to New York State Parks, the DEC, and others, of course, like Western New York Land Conservancy. Next, we'll move on to talking about some of the other invasive species that may already be in your forest and have a known presence in Western New York. Now, there are plenty of forest pests, invasive or otherwise, but I'm only going to focus on a handful of invasive species. So please just be aware that this is not an exhaustive list of invasive forest pests and diseases. So I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention emerald ash borer. 
Though this species has already devastated the forests of western New York, it's still a really important species to mention. So emerald ash borer is native to northeastern Asia and will lay its eggs in ash trees, which when they hatch, the larvae will feed on the inner bark of the ash tree. So as you can see, they create these S-shaped tunnels or galleries that are hidden beneath the bark of an infested tree. Once they turn to adults, they emerge from these very characteristic D-shaped exit holes, and it's then possible to see those small metallic green insects that only get up to about three quarters of an inch long. This species only lays its eggs in ash trees, so you may see this beetle out and about, but only ash trees are affected and will leave larvae in them. So despite its very small size, emerald ash borer, as I'm sure many of you will know, will completely kill the tree. So as the larvae feed on the inner bark of the tree, they disrupt the tree's ability to move water and nutrients, and this effectively starves the tree within a few years. While the adults can obviously fly and move around on their own, they are still very small beetles and depend largely upon humans to move them, and this usually occurs through the movement of firewood. So as I said earlier, emerald ash borer is a pretty devastating invasive species, and according to IMAP Invasives, a public database of invasive species observations in North America, which I will talk a bit more about later, there are currently 861 confirmed observations of emerald ash borer in western New York. Now the reason that I mention this species at all, because we have very few ash trees left in western New York, is because it's important that when we prevent the spread of invasive species, that we not only prevent the import of new invasive species into our area, but we also want to prevent the export of invasive species we have to other areas. So this map is also of IMAP Invasives data, and it's not that Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and the Adirondacks don't use IMAP, it's that they don't have very large infestations of emerald ash borer yet. In fact, emerald ash borer has only been found within the Adirondack Park for the first time this year. So I'll talk a bit more about prevention later on, but it's important to note that highly invasive and harmful forest pests like this one are important to keep track of even after they're well established in your area to prevent them from spreading to new areas. The next forest pest that I want to talk about is one that you may have never heard about. So first of all, I want to preface this by saying that the earthworms we're accustomed to seeing here are not native. The last ice age did a great job wiping out the native earthworms in the northern United States, and the surviving populations in the southern United States obviously move very slowly and haven't made their way back up to this area just yet. The earthworms in this area are hitchhikers from Europe that have become established to this area. But what I want to highlight today are the recent invasive species that are also known as crazy snake worms or Alabama jumpers because they have a very distinctive way of moving. This specific species was introduced from East Asia, and you can tell them apart first by the way that they move. So you can see in the video that they move much like a fish out of water, and at one point one even thrashes out of the container. This isn't the kind of behavior you would expect from worms that we are accustomed to in Western New York. You can also distinguish them by this band called a clitellum. In other worm species, it's raised, kind of like if they had a band-aid wrapped around their body. But jumping worms have a very smooth clitellum that lays flat against the rest of their body. The way they process the soil around them also produces a very granular soil structure that people often compare to used coffee grounds in texture. Part of why these species in particular are so damaging as opposed to the other earthworms that we're accustomed to seeing is that they grow twice as fast and reproduce more quickly than other earthworm species, which allows them to reach higher densities. All worms, but especially jumping worms, consume the organic matter in soil. Jumping worms, however, do so much more quickly than the species already here. And the removal of this organic matter can harm the plants in the area by inhibiting the growth of seedlings and wildflowers, which again require this organic matter to grow. And this harm can be felt up the food chain to soil invertebrates, salamanders, and even birds. So beyond this, these species, if they get in the soil of horticultural plants, can damage the roots of plants in nurseries, gardens, and turf. So again, this is data from IMAP Invasives, and there are currently only five confirmed observations of jumping worms in western New York, mostly centered around the Buffalo area. 
but given how difficult they can be to find, uh, we believe this may be more widespread than the data we currently have suggests. To that end, if you're interested in surveying your land, there is a very easy way to do it without having to dig up all of your soil, which we obviously don't want to happen. So you can make a mixture of water and yellow mustard seed and slowly pour this solution over a small patch of soil that you've cleared off of any leaf debris. And this will irritate the worms and some of the other soil invertebrates, but won't cause any lasting damage. And all of these critters will eventually make their way to the soil's surface, where you can identify and count any jumping worms you may have. This is pretty exciting stuff, but I wouldn't recommend getting right out of this webinar and surveying for jumping worms at this time of year. So all of the adults right now have died off and have really only left their eggs in the soil. So that being said, late August and early September are great times to survey for the species using this method because the adult worms are still alive and very large. So the next species I'd like to talk about is hemlock woolly adelgid. So looking for the species is very difficult to do with the naked eye because these are very tiny aphid-like insects that are less than 1 16th of an inch in length. However, during the fall and winter months, they produce and encase themselves in a white ovisac or woolly coating that makes them much easier to spot. So during this time, they will attach themselves to the base of a needle on the underside of a twig. So if you see something on the needle itself, it's probably not hemlock woolly adelgid. Early infestation will have just a few of these woolly masses on the underside of the twig, but as the infestation progresses, the majority of the needles on each tree will be seen to support this tiny insect, as you can kind of see in the bottom image on the slide here. Eventually, the hemlock woolly adelgid will cause the hemlock tree to take on a very ghostly gray appearance, as you can see in the top right hand picture on the screen. The heavy infestations will prevent any new growth on the tree as well. So lastly, hemlock woolly adelgid will only ever be found on hemlock trees. Hemlock trees have flat needles with white parallel lines on the underside of these needles. And you can start to look at the bark of each tree, which when compared with other evergreen species will have a reddish hue to it. That'll kind of clue you in that you may have a hemlock tree. And lastly, hemlocks usually grow in stands, so once you've found one, there will likely be others nearby. The reason we're so concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid is because it causes hemlock decline and mortality within four to 10 years of infestation. And hemlock trees are hugely important for our forested ecosystem. And they are the third most abundant tree in New York state. They provide food and shelter for many species of birds and mammals. Hemlocks make up much of the forest along shorelines and streams and are critical for preventing sedimentation and filtering out pollutants from our stream sources. Many municipal water sources in New York State come from water filtered by hemlock trees. And then lastly, the shade these trees provide around streams create cold water fisheries that are great for native brook trout and other species that are important sport fish. So even though the hemlock woolly adelgid spends most of its life firmly attached to the base of the hemlock needles, Hemlock woolly adelgid can be spread in two different life stages, as eggs and during its crawler phase. And this usually happens between March through July. So during this time, hemlock woolly adelgid is readily dispersed by wind, birds, deer, and other mammals, including people. Lastly, moving infested plants at any time of the year can also result in the spread of this pest. So again, this is an example of the IMAP invasives data that we have for hemlock woolly adelgid. As you can see in Western New York, it's still a pretty early invader. There are only 51 confirmed observations in Western New York. That being said, it is pretty heavily infested areas of the Finger Lakes. So the 51 observations we have in Western New York are probably pretty accurate. There are a lot of different groups that are going out and surveying for the species each and every year because they know and understand the risks of the species spreading further. So even though the data we currently have is pretty accurate, we want to stress how important it is to get out and survey for the species each and every year because there are different management options available for the species 
And the sooner we know about them, the more effective those management options are, and the easier it will be to further stop the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid. So this species is going to be very similar to hemlock woolly adelgid. This is the balsam woolly adelgid. This species is native to Central Europe and is very common on the West Coast, but is relatively new on the East Coast. This species only targets fur species, which in our area, the only native fur is the balsam fur. Like hemlock woolly adelgid, they are less than one millimeter in length and therefore really difficult to see, except over winter. So during the winter, the immature nymphs gather on the branches and trunk of fir trees and again, we'll develop this very woolly coating that makes them much easier to see, which you can kind of get an example of in the top photo. So besides this pretty characteristic indicator, you can also look for stunted growth at the top of a tree and also a swelling around the buds and nodes, which you can see in the bottom photo on the slide. Very heavy infestations will eventually cause some dieback of the tree, which will look like a browning or reddening of the foliage. Since Western New York doesn't have a huge fir tree population, the species doesn't present a huge environmental threat, but it is a much larger threat to the Christmas tree farms in Western New York. So fir trees are a very popular selection for Christmas trees because they have a nice shape, they have a nice smell, and they hold onto their needles very well. But people probably don't want to buy a Christmas tree that has this stunted growth or swollen masses on the trees that's not super festive. So even though it doesn't present a huge risk to the region in terms of our environment, it is still a concern. And again, very similarly to hemlock woolly adelgid, this species is spread largely by animals and wind. It can attach on the clothes and boots of people and move that way. However, we also have the additional threat of being imported on Christmas trees that may have the insect on them. The IMAP data for this species has two known infestations in Western New York, so it is by no means widespread, but it is still something to be on the lookout for and report if you do see it. So those are some species that we already have in the area, and next we're going to switch gears a little bit to focus on species that may be on their way to Western New York. So one of the most important species that we're currently on the lookout for is spotted lanternfly. This has been a pretty hot topic in outreach, so you've likely heard about it before, but if not, great, this will be your introduction. So these are leafhopper insects from Asia that are going to be very bad for our region. So definitely remember what these guys look like and keep a lookout for them. In their first stage of development in the top left photo, they appear as very small insects that are about one quarter of an inch long. During this stage, they are often mistaken for ticks just because of how small they are. The spotted lanternfly nymphs, however, do have six legs as opposed to ticks, which have eight legs. So this is a good indicator that you may have spotted lanternfly. As they grow up and develop, they do develop this red coloration, as you can see in the top right photo. This stage is a little bit bigger at up to three quarters of an inch long. Eventually, they develop into adults, as seen in the two photos in the middle, one with its wings spread out that people often compare to a moth or butterfly and the adults can get up to one inch long and are very distinctive looking. The adults will lay eggs that look very similar to dried mud, which you can see in the bottom photo. And unlike some species that only lay their eggs on trees, spotted lanternfly will actually lay its eggs on any surface, including automobiles, outdoor furniture, lumber, anything you can think of. And I say that this is such a dangerous pest because it feeds on over 70 different plant species including some of our really important agricultural crops like apples, grapes, hops, stone fruit trees, and many more. So this is obviously not an ideal species to have in Western New York. And when I say they feed on it, spotted lanternfly often comes in swarms. And in Pennsylvania, which is kind of ground zero for the species, wineries are losing acres of grapes to this pest. And any grapes that are left behind have pretty much all of the sugars removed from them. So as you can imagine, this doesn't make great wine. This is a huge threat to our agricultural industry. But beyond that, as spotted lanternfly drinks the sap from its host plants, which are very high in sugar, it actually excretes much of this sugar back in a substance called honeydew. When large swarms of spotted lanternfly are in the area, they produce huge amounts of this honeydew, which makes outdoor recreation not super appealing if you have honeydew and sticky substances raining down on you. 
Large amounts of honeydew also encourages the growth of sooty mold, which, if left covering the leaves of plants, can interfere in photosynthesis. But even though the species is very much a huge threat to agriculture, it also threatens our sugar maples, oak, walnut, and other native tree species. It's also particularly fond of Tree of Heaven, an invasive tree that can be found in forests and is very common in western New York, so it's really important to monitor these trees for spotted lanternfly. And the species is spread by humans moving, especially through shipping. So since they lay their eggs on pretty much anything, even visiting Pennsylvania for a few days at the wrong time of year could be a potential way to bring them back to western New York, to say nothing of interstate shipping. So hopefully I haven't scared you too much. The good news is that we currently only have one known infestation of the species in New York State, and this is all the way down in Staten Island. So several dead adults have been found throughout New York State, but nothing yet that can develop its own free-living population. So I included two maps on this slide, not to confuse you, but to show you just how much this species has spread in one year. So the map on the left is from September of 2019, and the map on the right is a map from September of this year. And I just want to point out how, despite the very best efforts of a lot of different entities, the quarantine zone has expanded pretty substantially in just the past year, and we now have an entirely new quarantine zone on the other side of Pennsylvania. So again, this is definitely one to report, um, and I would encourage you that even if you're not sure if you have spotted lanternfly, that you still report it. We'd rather have false reports than an overlooked positive report. So the next species we have is Asian longhorn beetle. This is native to China and Korea, and it's a very large beetle. It gets up to one and a half inches long. It can be pretty difficult to tell apart from native species like the white spotted pine sawyer, but the bluish tinge on its legs and antennae are pretty characteristic of Asian longhorn beetle, which you can kind of see in the bottom photo here. So very similar to emerald ash borer, it will also lay its eggs in trees, which then tunnel around, killing the tree. Its exit holes, however, are much larger. They get up to half an inch in diameter and are very circular in shape. So this species targets hardwoods, including birch, poplar, horse chestnut, willow, and several others, but its favorite is sugar maple, which is not only one of the most common trees in New York State, but also creates our maple syrup industry and displays really nice fall foliage colors. So this species is not something that we want to lose, both for our own selfish human needs, but also for the role it plays in our forested ecosystems. The way that Asian longhorn beetle tunnels through hardwood trees also makes the wood useless for milling. And like many of our invasive forest pests, this one also gets moved around on firewood and was originally introduced in wooden shipping containers. Like spotted lanternfly, this is another species that is being taken very seriously and has been working well towards eradication. So anytime an infestation is reported, all of the infested trees are removed and chipped into very small pieces, and then the area within a half a mile radius is placed into a very strict quarantine. And then all of these actions are followed up by repeated surveys for a minimum of four years before they can officially be declared eradicated. There are many sites that have been eradicated and the species isn't an imminent threat to Western New York, but it is something to be aware of and keep a lookout for. The New York State DEC does put out reminders every summer to check your pool filters to make sure you don't have this species hanging out in your pool filter. So now we're going to move away from our forest pests and get into some forest diseases, during which we have our first fungus. So oak wilt is caused by a fungus that we're not really sure exactly where it came from. We do know that it attacks the xylem of the tree where the water is transported. Ultimately, this creates a blockage which inhibits the water transport in an oak tree and results in the leaves wilting and dying from the tree. Oak trees in the red oak group are much more severely affected than those in the white oak group. Symptoms of oak wilt in your red oak group appear in late spring or early summer, and the trees can actually die one to four months after the initial infection. Symptoms in the white oak group appear in mid to late summer and progress much more slowly, 
Usually you'll only get a few branches showing dieback in a year, and the white oak group trees can take up to 20 years to die once you notice your first symptom of infection. So one of the key indicators of this disease is the browning of the leaves, and this is especially occurring along the margins of the leaves or the outside. And this coloration will usually begin developing at the very top of the tree and will begin to move downwards. Alternatively, you may also find a lot of leaves falling off the tree during the growing season while they're still nice and green. So not during the fall, but much earlier. Within one year of the tree dying, you can begin to see a spore mat developing underneath the bark of the tree, and this causes a vertical split in the bark. So obviously massive die-offs of any tree species is bad for the ecosystem and for people, but this is especially true of oak trees. So if anyone is familiar with Doug Ptolemy, who is a pretty renowned entomologist and very avid proponent of planting native species, he has a new book coming out next year called The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology and Our Most Essential Native Tree Species. And he makes such a bold claim in his book title because research has shown that oak trees support over 500 species of moths and butterflies alone. So just to give you kind of a point of reference, maple trees support just under 300 species of butterflies and moth species. So oak trees are a really important tree species that support a lot of different species all the way up the food chain. Beyond this, people just really like oak trees and the death of these trees can also come with a lowering of property values. In terms of how this species spreads, it's primarily spread by fungus spores. So the death of a tree due to oak wilt will cause an abundant growth of the fungus directly underneath the tree bark. And this growth often results in a longitudinal splitting of the bark. And these mats usually form in the spring and fall and produce a fruity odor. Sap feeding insects are then attracted to this odor and come to feed on the tree. By doing so, they inadvertently pick up the spores. An insect may then travel a long distance to feed on another tree, thus passing the fungus to this tree and can result in the spread of this disease over very long distances. So this is why New York State encourages that you don't prune your trees between March and September because it does create this kind of open wound that can make an oak very easily susceptible to oak wilt. So beyond the spreading through sap feeding insects, stands of oak trees are known to develop these root grafts between one another, and this essentially allows them to share nutrients between one another. However, these root grafts are also capable of transmitting oak wilt, so this makes it very easy for the fungus to spread between an entire stand of oak trees. Lastly, fungal spore mat can actually stay active in dead trees for three years, so the movement of firewood can also contribute and help spread this species far and wide. Very similar to the rapid response we've seen with Asian longhorn beetle, New York State has done a really good job of surveying for oak wilt and managing any infestations they do find. So if a stand is found to have infected trees, the infected trees are removed, chipped, and then finally incinerated. <laughs> So they also run trenches around the site to break up any of the root grafts that may further transmit oak wilt. And then once they've done this, these areas are placed again into a quarantine and monitored for at least five years. The closest area to Western New York that has oak wilt is in South Bristol and Canandaigua, which is right next door in the Finger Lakes Prism region. So finding the species wouldn't be a huge surprise in Western New York. And again, if you aren't certain, you can report any suspicions you have to a DEC forester. And then the last species I want to talk about today is sudden oak death. This species is a fungus-like water mold. This is another pathogen in the same family that actually caused the potato blight epidemics in Europe. And this species infects two types of hosts, the bark canker hosts, which in Western New York are largely made up of our native oak trees, and then foliar hosts. So this includes rhododendrons, azalea, viburnum, and lilacs, as well as other species as well. Most of the foliar hosts show some foliar dieback, but this won't kill the plant, and this can often be mistaken for other maladies. The bark canker hosts, however, develop oozing, seeping bark cankers, as seen in the photos above, and will have foliage dieback as well, ultimately resulting in the death of the tree. 
This species is relatively hard to diagnose, so if you see anything strange happening with your oak tree, again, feel free to contact the DEC forester to report it and hopefully get some samples sent to the lab. So sudden oak death has very similar effects on our oak trees to oak wilt that we've already discussed. However, in addition, because oak wilt can use rhododendrons and azaleas, as well as other common horticultural plants as hosts, the transmission of this species may also impact nurseries if they have to halt trade or destroy stock because of sudden oak death. Research into the specific pathways of the species are currently ongoing, but it looks like infected nursery stock has played a pretty large role. They also believe that spores may be dispersed by wind and rain, and even potentially through the movement of people. Sudden oak death is a very large threat on the west coast, but in the research I've done, I've only found one case in New York State, and that was downstate. According to this map, Western New York is a pretty low risk for the species, but given that the map was made in 2004, this may have changed and again is a good idea to keep a lookout for, especially if you're already watching out for oak wilt. So hopefully I haven't depressed you all with all of the invasive species that are present or making their way to Western New York's forest, but now comes the best part of any presentation, motivating people to take action and help us prevent the spread of these species. So these are all things that anyone can do, and I would really strongly encourage you to take them to heart and help us prevent the spread of these invasive forest pests and diseases. By far the largest vector for invasive pests and diseases in forests is the movement of firewood. New York State does have a firewood regulation requiring that firewood may not be imported into New York State from any other state or country and that untreated firewood may not be transported more than 50 miles. Despite this, it obviously does still happen. It's very tempting if you're going camping to bring wood that you already have instead of buying firewood at the campsite for probably marked up prices, but it is really important. If you're using wood to heat your home this winter, the same thing. Even though you may find some really cheap firewood from a private landowner, please make sure it's safe to transport, and this will help prevent the spread of invasive species. This is a great infographic produced by the Don't Move Firewood campaign. There's a lot of great info here, but my favorite is in the top right here. And this is, illustrates a study done in Michigan that found that 23% of the pieces of firewood they looked at had wood boring beetles inside, and another 41% had evidence of a previous infestation. And I think this really illustrates just how easy it is to transport beetles, even though a piece of firewood may look fine. And as I was saying with the emerald ash borer example, we really have to be sure that we're not only bringing in new problems for our forests, but that we're actively working to ensure that we're not exporting these problems either, especially to our really special forests like those in the Adirondack State Park. For some of the species we've discussed, I would also encourage you to make sure that you're cleaning off your shoes and clothing, as well as any tires on any of the gear that you use. This is a great way to prevent the spread of these, as well as other invasive species that we didn't talk about today, namely a lot of our herbaceous plants. By making sure that your boots are clean of mud and debris, you can stop the spread of fungal spores and jumping worms, as well as the seeds of other invasive species. At first, this habit may seem like a lot to remember, but personally, I just leave a small bristled brush in my hiking backpack right alongside my tick kit, so I'm sure to never forget either of them, and it really quickly just becomes a habit to clean off your footwear as well as your other gear. While you're out and about recreating outdoors, you can also use a really great tool called IMAP Invasives to document the invasive species that you find. I know Andy mentioned a great app as well, so this is just another app to put onto your phone so that you're always prepared. IMAP Invasives is a citizen or community science initiative, which means that anyone can contribute data and this data is actively used by managers and educators like myself. Many citizen and community scientists use the IMAP Invasives app to really easily collect observations in the field. And the best part is that you don't need access to cell service or Wi-Fi when you're taking these observations. All of the data that is collected through this app is then added to a public database of invasive species observations that covers many states and provinces in North America. 
and you can pull up the map on your desktop, computer, or laptop and maybe find your house or your favorite recreational area on the map and figure out what invasive species are around you. All of this data is contributed by individual people, so if there isn't any data around your house or favorite recreation area, you can always go out for yourself and map them. This is a really interesting and helpful tool that invasive species managers use the data for all the time. Again, if you're interested in learning more about this program, which I would highly recommend, you can use the link on the screen. They have a lot of great tutorials on their website to help you learn more about the mobile app, as well as how to navigate the, the map itself. And though both are fairly user-friendly and intuitive, if you are a little less comfortable with technology, these tutorials are a great way to get your feet wet and get familiar with the app and the map itself. And then lastly, just once more, I'd like to encourage you to go out and perform periodic surveys of your area. Uh, the invasion curve, which I have on the screen now, does a really nice job of illustrating how the sooner that we catch an infestation, the less expensive and the more successful any management action we take will be. So by getting out there early and often, we are better able to eradicate species and prevent their spread. And with that, we will close out our presentation. I want to thank Andy one more time for joining us and sharing his experience with beech leaf disease. We have three more presentations planned in the coming weeks on topics including invasive agricultural pests and diseases, woody invasive species management, and new aquatic threats in western New York. I'd also like to point out that the Western New York Land Conservancy is hosting an event tonight at 7 p.m. Joan Mayloof, writer, professor emeritus, and founder of the Old Growth Forest Network will discuss her book, Nature's Temples, The Complex World of Old Growth Forests, as well as Western New York Land Conservancy staff talking about their newest plans for the College Lodge Forest. I'd also like to take some time to encourage you to follow us on social media. We post very regularly on Facebook and Instagram, and are obviously working to grow our collection of videos on YouTube, such as this one. Lastly, if you think of any questions after this, or if you want to get in touch with me, feel free to email me or Andy using the address on the screen.